48. 48. So it's over 60 years ago. I mean, 60 years ago, it's 1954. I mean, this hospital was put here <clears throat> six years before the Brown versus Board of Decision. And it was put here by a special act in Congress <clears throat> that recognized that poor people were not having access to medical care. So there was an act of Congress, an act of Congress that brought this hospital to rule this in my family. Now maybe there was a day that some people couldn't go to, but as time moved on, it became a facility where regardless of your race, or your color, or your ability to pay, you had access. And that's why now there's a history in this community. People of different races, different colors, different political parties can all say, I was born at the hospital by the war. Or my mother's life was saved at the hospital by the war. Or my life was saved. Because this hospital historically has been a part of unifying this community. You know, somebody asked me the other day, man, how are we together? You know, we happen uh, because of his political party. They don't know what mine is. And one time I was independent. I don't know what it is right now. I, I do more. I just try to fight for what's right. It doesn't really matter to me. At the NAACP, uh, NAACP, we have no permanent friends, no permanent enemies on the permanent issue. But then I said to them, I said, but you know what you don't understand is that there are some things that bring people together. Let me tell you one of them. Talk to a number of soldiers, and they say, when you're in a foxhole and bullets are red, you really don't have to worry about what color somebody is or what part they are. You just want to know, do they have your back? If the lights were to go off in here because we couldn't pay the light bill, it's amazing. You wouldn't know black or white because in the dark, all of us are saying <laughs> If you get sick and you need some blood transfusion, I don't know anybody that goes to the hospital and in the middle of the needing blood transfusion says, wait a minute, tell me was that person Republican or Democrat or white or black? They, you just want to know if you're a type A, is that blood type A? And isn't it amazing, it doesn't matter what person's economic status was, what color they were, all that matters is that blood type. Because the Bible says from one blood, God has made all people. The other thing that brings us together is pain. Pain. And the potential for pain. And that's what has brought us together. What this hospital, is, this, this company is doing is immoral. I sat in a meeting with the mayor when we went to meet the violence board. And they suggested to us that they only have two choices. That is a choice of whether to hurt poor people in, in Bell Haven or whether to provide care for poor children in their pediatric ward in Green. It's a false dichotomy to always pit poor people against poor people. To make every decision about the bottom line when, number one, you're not, there are ways you could fix the bottom line, but you choose not to fix the bottom line. So it's immoral. So that's why I'm here tonight and uh, wanted to tell you about this Title VI complaint. Mm -hmm. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was an act of Congress, too. A Republican and a Democrat sponsored in 1964. It was passed. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in Title VI says that no entity that receives federal money, can receive that money, and then engage in actions which are discriminatory, or that will have what is called a disparate impact on protected groups, i.e. poor people, minorities, African American, women. Can't do it. It's illegal. And so when we look at this, this 44 page contract, that Biden signed. <clears throat> and we look at how poor minorities and other people have been previously served by the Pungo Hospital. 
and how you would have statutory emergency rooms honored. And how in their contract they said, according to this Title VI, that they would respect the medical economic center of their public health system. And in their contract, that's why I like the mayor, he goes to the heart of the matter. In their contract, not what they felt that we will feel like doing this. They didn't say we might do this. They didn't say we could do this. In the contract that they signed with your community, they said they would maintain and strengthen this hospital. In other words, you would never have less services, and they would work to give you more services. Now, I don't know, I'm not being ugly, but I don't know how the other group, I heard the paper, they said the contract wasn't violated. Well, we had three lawyers to read. And we got in quotes here where they said, what they said, they would maintain and strengthen. In section 2.4.1.1, they said they would ensure that indigent care is available to the population of Buford and Hyde counties at the level related to needs as previously demonstrated by Pungo. This is their word. They're, they're, and I know they have good lawyers. I'm sure their lawyers went over every line of this. They said they would operate Pungo District Hospital within Pungo service areas as of the closing date as a community health care provider open to the general public free of discrimination based on race, creed, color, sex, or national origin. That's what they said. And they said that meant according to the contract, that when they say that they are going, in spite of the contract, to replace this hospital with a clinic with no emergency facilities, they have violated their contract and they have created a discriminatory action in this community. Violet knew. There's no way they couldn't know it. Any good doctor would know. You've already heard doctors talk about that golden hour. They knew that their acts would cause premature deaths in adults and infants and other poor people of color. They had to know it. Not only that, we put in our complaint that Biden agents knew while negotiating the terms. They had to know, because this happened for less than two years, that Biden's real objective was to rid itself of what it perceived as a less profitable, the less profitable aspect of the Pungo District Hospital, including the emergency facilities, and replace these aspects with the highly profitable health services for middle and high income people. Because Biden knew all along its real purpose. His promise to maintain and strengthen the hospital was a pretext made in bad faith to cover the discriminatory policies and practices he planned. This is what our lawyers wrote in that complaint. Biden knew or, that Pungo Hospital served about 25,000 patients per year from Buford and High County, a poor, undeserved population that needs timely access to health services. And something else they knew. They knew that the Federal Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act ensures that all patients are screened and stabilized regardless of their ability to pay in the emergency department. In other words, they know that if there's an emergency department there, they have to serve the people. Now, their, 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 their word to us now is, well, just trust them. <laughs> just, 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 just trust us. Huh? I got a problem with that as a preacher. Because my the Bible tells me to put no confidence in man. Trust them. No, we don't need to trust them. We need a law. We don't need a promise. We need a law. 
We need an emergency room that's covered by the law. We don't need optional health care or optional emergency or optional treatment where you can or you can't. We need to have the full implementation, say this with me, of the federal emergency medical treatment and active labor act that ensures all patients are screened, stabilized, regardless of their ability to pay, regardless of their color, regardless of their party, regardless of anything in emergency department. That's what we want. We want a facility protected by the law. It was an act of Congress that got this hospital here, and we want this hospital protected by the act of Congress that makes it illegal for you not to treat somebody when they come to an emergency room. And we demand nothing less. Now, the last thing, and I'm going to turn this over to my friends real quickly. And, and I apologize, I'm actually on my way to D.C. tomorrow. <laughs> We're struggling with this issue of voting uh, and protecting voting rights, and then on my way to Wisconsin. Uh, the, the other, the other, what is that fly in the ointment? The other fly in the ointment is that our General Assembly voted to deny Medicaid. Now, I know some folks don't want to talk about this. And, and, and you may have some problems with the affordable health care. And look, anything human beings create uh, has some problems. Amen, church. Amen. Let, let me prove that to you. How many of y'all have some children that, that, that didn't always do right? <laughs> <laughs> so anything a human being messes with is going to have some problems. But you didn't throw your children away. You corrected the problem, but you didn't throw them away. So there may be one or two problems with affordable care, but Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican, was the first one in the 1900s that called for every American to have health care. Well, it was a Republican. That's a Republican idea. But one good thing about it, you, you have to agree with this down here in eastern North Carolina, Medicaid expansion that would increase the number of poor people, not poor black people, but poor people that would have access to health care. Now, I grew up in Eastern North Carolina. There are a lot of poor people. And I do recall, there are a lot of poor people. When I used to take my little lunchbox to school, little white guy would have his lunchbox. We opened them, and both of them were poor, so come on. <laughs> Sometimes all he had on his sandwich was jelly. And all I had on mine was peanut butter. And I say, man, give me half. You give me your top half. And I give them we have pizza. So come on, y'all. There's some poor people down here. Right? I don't care what color you are. And so the affordable health care would have covered 500,000 people in North Carolina. Now, I didn't bring the night with me the number of people that would include both black and white in, in Hyde County, in Boofa County. When, that, when our legislators, those that, that, that voted for it, you need to find out how where yours voted. Cut that, that meant that money would no longer be available. Now, Duke is having to lay off people because of that. UNC is having to lay off people. So you know the impact that it has to have in a hospital like Pumbo. You see what I'm saying? So, having said that, I come to announce tonight that an investigator has been formally assigned to this Title VI case. The Office of Civil Rights has said formally that they are taking the case, Mayor. They have called on the Justice Department to speed up the investigation. Our lawyers will have at least two conversations with them this week. We are telling them that this is an emergency. And we need the intervention 
of federal government. I tell people, don't I always say you don't want the government involved. Sometimes you need the government involved. <laughs> Secondly, we need you, especially the leadership here, the elected, the, the, you need to call Senator Hagan. The town council, y'all need to call her and say, Senator, we need you to push the Office of, of Civil Rights. You need to call Walter Jones. You need to call him. If it's your cousin, call him. If he ain't your cousin, call him. <laughs> Whoever, I mean, this is a time, if you're Republican, we need you. If you're Democrat, we need you. I, I'm serious. That, see, once you get elected, you're supposed to serve all the people. He needs to call Butterfield. He needs to call G.K. Butterfield. Call him. You need to call Burr. You need to call Burr. They, they should not, because they oversee these laws as Congress people. You need to call them and tell them, we need you as our sitting senators and our sitting representatives to tell the Office of Civil Rights to get involved. In fact, the Office of Civil Rights has the authority to actually stop the closing until an investigation. Yeah, you know, the Office of Civil Rights, if they want to, if, you, if they get enough pressure, and let me tell you how they can do it, they'll pick up the phone and they'll say to Biden, we think we need to look into this and we need to have a mediation session with everybody, and Biden can say, we don't want to do that. They say, okay, well, we'll pull all the federal money. <laughs> Since it's about money, I think Biden will listen. <laughs> they understand that. And the Office of Civil Rights has that authority, but you need to call them. You need to call them. As a city town, I'm serious, as a town council, call them and say, we need you to make sure this investigation is done. And you need to then call in your local senators, your state senators and state representatives. Now, I, I can tell you what they did because I got a report card out there, but I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to be nice. You need to ask them, did they vote against Medicaid expansion? Especially when nine Republican governors have supported and nine Republican legislators. And you need to tell them in the short session, they need to repeal the denial. They said, we don't like affordable health care. Tell them that's not what you're talking about, the whole thing. They don't like the part, they don't like fight about that. But this part called Medicaid expansion, everybody should like it because it helps the poor. And Jesus said, when I was hungry, did you feed? I mean, good Christian can support that. And you need to tell them to repeal their decision and allow Medicaid expansion for poor people in this state so that people poor, black and white, in these poor counties can have access and so that Biden can't use that as an excuse that why they won't be able to handle the number of poor people coming through the door. Those are two things you need to do. And I believe if we do them together, we can make a difference. You know, the scripture says it like this. This is the first week of Lent. If my people will call by my name, will humble themselves, pray, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. We need a healing in the land. We need a healing in our businesses. We need a healing at Biden. We need a healing in this community. And if, and if it took this to bring the us together, then let's stay together. <laughs> let's fight together. Let's pray together. Let's stand together. Now, Reeve, come in. I, I, she doesn't want me to do this, but come here. Run up here, baby. I want to give you, and I'm going to turn this over. They, they don't want to talk as long as me, man. And I appreciate this opportunity. I want y'all to see this beautiful young lady. This is my daughter. This is my daughter. And uh, you want to tell them anything about you? You want to tell them why health care is so important to you? Huh? You want to tell them? Okay. I want you to see, because I think about if we were living here. I want her to tell you quickly her story. See, her story. She told us to Senator the Hagan as a, a way to push Senator the Hagan to vote for affordable health care. Um, I think health care is important to everyone especially people with pre-existing conditions, because um, people like me are put into situations that we can't control. 
Um, when I was only a baby, I was diagnosed with hydrocephalus, which is a brain condition. And basically, I was saved, and I'm here now. Um, but I remember you know, going to the hospital and looking around and seeing so many other people there um, waiting for help. And you know, I often think about it now. Um, you know, what if they didn't have health care? Some of them probably didn't. You know, it was such a long wait for me, but I had health care and I got taken care of. And I'm here today. And you know, I had a brain condition, but here I am today. You know, on the honor, the on the honor roll at school. You know, doing good. So, I think it's important to just think about other people and not just ourselves. She's 20 years old. She's almost a straight, but now she's a straight A student at North Carolina Central on full scholarship. And but number of times we've had to take her to the emergency room. And we haven't had to do it in a while, but early on. And I think about that. This booth was in my mind. What if we had had to drive three hours? You know, I, I don't mean to put her on blast, but on you can't see it, but I know right here on on the right side of her head there's a button. Uh, right, right, right here, here, right here on the on the right. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was your big head, <laughs> but that's on the right. But it's, it's a, actually a button there.